Donc j'ai le de plaisir d'accueillir euh, comme président de séance euh, Marie Lavandier, donc directrice du Centre de recherche et de restauration des musées de France, et qui va nous accompagner pendant cette fin de matinée. Voilà, bonjour à tous. Écoutez, euh, d'abord, merci beaucoup à, à l'organisation de m'avoir proposé de, de m'associer à, euh, à cette journée sur un thème qui, bien évidemment, me, me réjouit particulièrement et mobilise, je pense, chacun d'entre nous. Et puis, euh, plus particulièrement, de m'avoir associé à cette, euh, cette demi-journée sur le thème de, de la lumière. Euh, parce que je dois dire que la lumière, euh, c'est un, un vrai sujet au cœur de... de du dilemme qui est, qu est la vie d'un musée. Parce qu'un musée, c'est une machine à offrir les objets, une machine à, à montrer. Euh, et on a beau avoir beaucoup travaillé depuis euh, euh, quelques années sur le développement de visites multisensorielles, euh, le musée reste un lieu où euh, euh, le sens de la vue reste le sens... Euh, le plus sollicité et euh, la condition de la vue, de la visibilité, évidemment, euh, c'est la lumière. Donc sans lumière, profondément, vraiment, il n'y a, a pas de musée. Euh, et en même temps, la lumière, vous le savez, c'est un des, un des facteurs euh, majeurs de, de dégradation des objets que, que nous avons pour mission, euh, certes de montrer, mais aussi de, de préserver. Euh, donc on, on, on se trouve ce matin au cœur de ce, au cœur de ce sujet, comment, euh, voilà, comment offrir un, un éclairement satisfaisant et en même temps assurer une, un niveau de, de conservation et de durabilité euh, de, nos, de nos collections euh, également satisfaisant. Euh, alors ce matin on a vu euh, dans une première partie de la matinée euh, un premier type d'approche qui consiste à, à s'intéresser à la, à la lumière elle-même, comment, comment contrôler euh, euh, les types de lumière, les qualités de lumière, les quantités de lumière euh, euh, qu'on applique aux objets. Et pour cette seconde partie de la matinée, on va s'intéresser à une, un autre type d'approche qui est évidemment euh, euh, profondément complémentaire, qui euh, passe par... Euh, une, une identification euh, fine euh, du risque euh, lié à, à l'exposition à la lumière, donc et un certain nombre de, 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 de dispositifs, de techniques, de méthodologies aussi, d'évaluation de, des, 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 des risques afférents. Donc j'ai le plaisir d'accueillir Bruce Ford pour, pour euh, euh, engager cette discussion. Euh, Bruce, vous travaillez à Canberra, en, en, en Australie. Vous êtes euh, conservation scientist, c'est assez difficile à traduire en français, paradoxalement, parce qu'il y a des conservation, des conservation scientists en France également. Et euh, euh, vous travaillez entre autres pour le, pour le, le musée national euh, d'Australie. Vous avez une approche assez complète qui peut concerner aussi bien les, les pratiques et politiques de conservation et restauration euh, dans les musées. D'ailleurs, vous avez été responsable de la, de la conservation au, au, à la National Gallery of Australia que euh, euh, les peintures rupestres euh, aborigènes, par exemple, ou la, 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 la protection des, des sites. Vous avez également été enseignant à, à, à l'université de, de Canberra il y a quelques années. Vous allez nous proposer une intervention dont le titre est, je trouve, plein de promesses, enfin, pour un esprit du type du mien, « Breaking the rules ». Uh, light exposure risk assessment and microfading. Micro uh, nous vous écoutons, je vous remercie. Thank you very much. I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here, even if I'm <coughs> still perhaps mentally in Australia with regard to jet lag. Um, I'm going to talk about fading, uh, lighting guidelines, and particularly the cost of lighting guidelines, and how we dealt with these issues at the National Museum of Australia when the museum could no longer financially afford to implement their lighting guidelines. But before I start, I'd like to remind us of what is potentially at stake with light fading. This Robert Motherwell collage, which contains a rhodamine dyed paper component, which we'll see in a minute, 
is a good example of what conservatives are trying to avoid, which is an important work that's been badly damaged by light fading within a generation. So this is what it would have looked like in 1943. So how do we deal with this type of problem? Generally speaking, we try to minimise the risk of fading with generalised lighting guidelines based on fading rate data from very limited accelerated exposure studies in general. Most of these involve, as Paul pointed out earlier, restricting how long something may be displayed over a period of time before it's put back into the dark. The first thing that has to be said is that everybody has a different idea of how much time it should spend in the dark. For light sensitive material, Thompson suggested 50 lux and low UV, but made no recommendation for how long to display them. For the same material, roughly, the Tate display works on paper for four years out of every eight, if I remember correctly, at 80 lux. The Victoria and Albert Museum suggest two years and 10 at 50 lux, and the CIE and CIE 157 recommend one year's display per decade, that's a 1 in 10 display ratio, at 50 lux, which uh, I think as a general recommendation is probably unrealistic and probably only serves to make conservatives feel guilty. We should be asking how effective are these guidelines? Are they cost effective? Can they be counterproductive? And as Tim Padfield, who's somewhere out there, uh, has perhaps mischievously argued, are they designed, in some cases, more for conservatives' comfort and convenience than their effectiveness in preventing fading? So, some examples. Here we have two sketches by Francis Bacon containing ballpoint pen inks and a modern ballpoint pen stolen by myself from a hotel. I microfade tested all three in 2011 where, where I was working at the Tate in London. And here are some relative fading rates. I should explain here, I'm departing from the script, I'm sorry to the translators. Blue wool fading standards are a series of um, dyed fabrics which fade at known rates. They happen to be blue for, various, for a particular reason. Blue wool one is the worst. It's the one that fades fastest. So. Blue wool one is to the far left of this diagram, and that's considered really awful by museum standards. The Francis Bacon sketches are reasonably light fast. They're better than blue wool four. But the modern Novotel hotel ink, the pen I had in the previous slide, is probably the worst I've ever seen. It's way, 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 way worse than blue wool one. It would probably fade more in a year on display than the Bacon sketches would in a hundred years of permanent display. So why are the rates so different? It's very simple, because the dyes are different. Thalassanine blue at the, on the left, okay, this one here, um, is extremely light fast. It's used for car paints and probably the bacon ballpoint pen inks. But the other dyes there, the methyl blue and Victoria blue and rhodamine, they're awful. They're terrible. And you can't tell which is safe to display just by looking at the inks. They're all just blue inks. And chemical analysis is usually not feasible. And even if you did do that, or you could do that, had the capacity to do it, you'd still need to find fading rate data for the unknown dyes that you'd identified. So the only way to be absolutely safe is to treat all ballpoint pens as if they were like the Novotel ink, which means effectively not displaying any of them. In other words, never displaying those Francis Bacon sketches. It's not surprising then that conservators worry about fading and enthusiastically welcome strict rules when someone comes up with them. Now, I'm about to explain the context for the rest of this talk, but it's different for every museum, depending on their, their display rhythms and their requirements, and sometimes the legislation. The National Museum of Australia is quite a new museum, Social History Museum. It's only 20 years old, began collecting maybe 50 years ago with about 600,000 objects, 5,000 of which might be on display at any time. So most of them are sitting there in the dark. Importantly for this talk, museums, the museum has a series of core permanent exhibitions on different themes. Uh, at the moment it's land, nation and people. 
And these are renewed every 10 years or so. So when I say permanent exhibition, it really means a decade. These exhibitions and the particular objects within them are locked into school curricula. They're featured in educational and advertising material, videos on the web, and so on. In this context, light-driven object changeovers, in other words, objects that are taken off display to go back in the dark, are not particularly welcome in these permanent exhibitions because they can involve far more than just replacing an object in a case. When I took on this job at the National Museum, they had a lighting policy uh, based on one published by the Victoria and Albert Museum, which allowed a certain amount of light exposure per, per decade, depending on which category of light fastness a colourant was assumed to belong to. The main thing to notice here is that the sensitive, or the red category, in which objects are restricted to two years per decade, embraces everything less light fast than blue wool four, but blue wool four is about 30 times more light fast than blue wool one, and some colourants are much less stable than blue wool one, as we've seen with that ballpoint pen ink. But the breadth of this category, it's all encompassing nature, is necessary because the available fading rate data is just not there, particularly for modern materials, I might say. And I think with this diagram, note in particular it's assumed that objects will be immediately put back on display after their eight years in storage is over. This is the assumption behind the lighting diagram. This is the assumption behind the restrictions. It's on display for two years, it's put in the dark for eight, and then it's immediately put back on. I think that, that's a false assumption. These tables contain information about which category a colour it might belong to. However, descriptions like sensitive pigments, which you can see there, assume knowledge both of the identity of the pigments and their sensitivity. It's not very helpful. And they only really cover traditional European art materials. And which plastics, I might ask, are excluded from the definition up there, most plastics? This one? That one? The result at the museum was that nearly everything coloured was pushed into the sensitive range to be safe and limited to two years display per decade. Conservators slept well knowing that the rules were being enforced. However, the finance officer was sitting up late with her spreadsheets. The consequences of the lighting guideline were first of all, it was hideously expensive as well as inconvenient. The finance department estimated, this is an order of magnitude estimate, that the cost of each light-driven object replacement was about $1,000, that's per object, including curatorial time, finding and interpreting replacements, relabeling, conservation activity, registration activity, exhibitions activity, photography, and so on. Finance told conservation they had to spend less. So the question wasn't whether we save money, but how. A second consequence is that access to often important objects was limited. This directly affects the main mission of the museum, which is to tell the national story in an interesting and engaging way, preferably using objects that mean something to a lot of people. In other words, objects they know are there and they like to see when they come. The implementation of this lighting guideline was inflexible, uh, in some quarters anyway. The conservators were the lighting police, which is a phrase that Stefan Mikulski, if he's out there, will recognise as his. And the law was enforced on the understanding that curators are like cats. If you let them sleep on the bed once, they'll be scratching at the bedroom door every night. So no exceptions, unless of course the director says so. Aside from the lack of fading rate data, this rigid approach survived because conservators didn't consider and maybe didn't really care about risks other than meeting or failing to meet their rules. And this is a, a problem with rules. There are other uh, conservation consequences. Some objects fade much faster than the assumed blue wool to average, for which that two years per 10 is, is um, fitted for the sensitive range. Other objects are unnecessarily changed over and subjected to handling, transport, conservation treatments, exposed to light and so on as a result of these changeovers. So the first thing I did was some arithmetic, illustrated here by the cost over 10 years for a hand-dyed batik cloth from the Central Australian community of Urnabella. As a textile, it was classified as sensitive by definition. In other words, it was called, all textiles were classified as sensitive, allowed on display for only two years before being replaced by another. 
Over the life of the permanent exhibition, a changeover every two years costs $4,000. If the display time could be extended to five years, however, the single changeover would cost $1,000, saving 75% of the costs for which we were no longer going to get the money anyway. Uh, and these costs were running to hundreds of thousands of dollars per year across the museum. The question was not whether we should do this, but how to do it rationally, efficiently and safely. And the answer was to be more selective about the way we restrict things on display. The original guideline, which I showed you before, is based on the false premise that everything is an equal demand for, uh, for exhibition and will be equally exposed to light over, say, 20 or 50 years. It's true. Some of the treasures are in constant demand for exhibition, but others are only occasionally displayed when particular topics are addressed. These could be displayed for longer when they are displayed and still not exceed cumulative exposure limits, in this case a just noticeable fade per 50 years, if that means anything to anyone out there. We also wanted to separate out those objects for which colour is important from those for which colour change, if it occurred, would not be so disastrous. And for this task, we turn to formal significance assessment. We'll get back to that. The old guideline did not distinguish between colourants that faded at a rate equivalent to blue wall one or worse and blue wall four. And this became the job of microfading to make these distinctions based on accelerated light ageing. So first of all, significance and demand for display. Curators were invited to make an educated guess as to whether an object might be in high demand for display or not for the foreseeable future, say that over the next 20 years. We assumed that this depended on how significant the object was to the museum and used the Collection Council of Australia's significance guidelines as well as curators and conservators' experience. These guidelines encourage us to ask why something is important. Is it for aesthetic reasons, because it's unique, or because it's in fantastic condition? For example, is it unfaded? I use these guidelines to guide the discussion as to how to divide the objects into two categories only. This isn't very fancy. This is quite simple. For objects of high significance, likely to, display, likely to be displayed a lot, which is the assumption in the existing lighting guidelines, we would retain the two years per decade display. This is without doing microfading. This is purely an administrative issue, since they satisfy the assumption of constant demand. For objects of normal significance, or ones that are only in demand for exhibition intermittently, we would extend that display to five years per decade, because on average over time they're unlikely to receive so many megalux hours cumulative exposure. Uh, you'll note from the diagram I showed previously that five years per decade display is equivalent to the Tate practice. So this isn't a radical step in terms of museum practice, but an extremely cost-effective one nevertheless. We also looked at how damaging to the object's values colour change would be if it did occur. Is the exact shade of brown of a wooden spear, for example, as important as the same colour in a hand-coloured photograph? I only divided the collection into two categories because a desktop simulation using past exhibition showed that we could prevent the need for a large proportion of light-driven changeovers in this way. So there were some objections to this idea. Some curators and conservators uh, were and some are still very unhappy about basing preventive conservation decisions on value judgments, because this is what we're talking about. However, a close reading of Thompson reveals that he did not intend his 50 lux rule to apply to everything, but only to very valuable material, which is also very light sensitive. And I believe we ignored the first qualification and arguably exaggerated the second in many cases. Thompson's unqualified suggestion, rather than his actual opinion in the book, became an international quasi-standard, especially for loans and insurance purposes, which has resulted in a lot of miserably badly lit exhibitions, but it put a stop to some very serious fading. His qualified suggestion, the one you see in front of you there, was a very good idea and arguably hasn't been much improved on since. Furthermore, the Code of Ethics of the Australian Conservatives Professional Body, the AICCM, explicitly argues that in a world of strictly limited resources, we must make value judgments and put our money where it will do the most good. It's not unethical to make value judgments, it's actually necessary to do so. And finally, significance assessment is used for other collection risk management purposes to establish potential loss of value. So why not use it in this context 
where the risk of fading is roughly proportional to the risk of display. So here's some examples of these sorts of evaluations. Some of you might remember that in 1980 a baby was taken in Central Australia by a wild dog, a dingo, at Uluru. After a, a court trial in which the media portrayed the parents as cult-motivated baby killers, the mother was wrongly convicted of murder. She later donated a lot of material, including this black baby's christening dress, to the National Museum so that the story of her public persecution by the media and wrongful conviction in the courts could be told. The christening dress, which was said to prove that the parents were Satan-worshipping baby killers because it's black, is always in demand for loan and exhibition. In the language of the Collection Council of Australia Significance Guidelines, it has extremely high historical and social value in Australia, 35 years after the main events of this story. I personally would have argued that unlike a work of art, it's, it's aesthetic significance, and therefore its exact shade of black is quite low. And perhaps we shouldn't worry about a bit of fading. And now, well, while the family's still alive, while the mother's still around, is not the time to ration its exhibition on the grounds of fading. If we're going to fade it, let's fade it now while she's still alive and while the injustice is being perpetrated. However, the no exceptions rule prevailed. It was a textile, so it was restricted to two years, as were all other textiles. To me, this is a failure to think about why it was important. In other words, to pick apart its qualities in the way that the significance guidelines ask us to do. Going from the sublime to the ridiculous, these waterproof pants, also defined as a textile for the lighting guideline purposes, were part of a display illustrating the important national story of post-Second War development and European migration to Australia. They have interpretive significance, but the person who wore them is of no particular historical interest. They're hardly unique, and the exact colour isn't very important. However, like the dress, they were also restricted to two years per decade display because the rules said so and I think with even less justification. This beautiful, natural, dyed Aboriginal basket has aesthetic qualities that would be greatly affected if the colours faded. It isn't unique. In fact, we have a good collection of similar baskets, but very pristine examples like this one are rare for reasons we'll see later. It was restricted to two years, but in this case, there's a bit of a problem. The pristineness of it um, made making decisions on this difficult. So that's the significant side of thing, things. So we turn now to microfading. Paul Whitmore here in front of us today uh, invented the technique. And I thought it looked like a useful tool because it provides accelerated fading rate data for real objects rapidly, relatively cheaply, and non-destructively without having to do chemical analyses. Most museums can't do chemical analyses. It was invented by Paul Whitmore. The purpose was to divide up the sensitive range so that colourants at the bottom end, blue wool 4, could be distinguished from those that fade 10 or more times faster up at blue wool 2, uh, blue wool two and beyond. So there's those blue wools I was telling you about. I'll see if this works, but... Yep. So the higher up the chart here, the faster it fades. That's all we need to know for this. We don't need fine distinctions or exact predictions for uh, risk management purposes. Just a good idea of which end of the fading rate spectrum a colourant belongs. And like all accelerated ageing, this is risk management. It's not fortune telling. But we're trying to distinguish something that fades 30 times faster up here than something that fades at this rate here. The results of microfading in practice can be surprising and challenging. Here are two works from a state gallery in Australia which I fade tested this year. The first, a figure from Papua New Guinea classified as an ethnographic object, was to be displayed in sunlight in the entrance lobby of the museum. However, somehow the artists in Papua New Guinea got hold of rhodamine paint, which is far from light fast, um, up at Blue Wall 2 and climbing steadily. It's probably worse than Blue Wall 1 over the long term. The second is 1943 salted print by Henry Fox Talbot, the kind of photograph that you might be very reluctant to display at all. This one, however, appeared to be well fixed. It's in that period when Fox Talbot started to fix the, the, the pictures in a particular way. And neither the paper nor the image proved to be particularly light sensitive under accelerated ageing conditions. They're both, both blue wool four or better. You know, maybe 30 times more light fast than the ethnographic object. 
The museum's display intentions, which were based on categories from their lighting guidelines like salted print and ethnographic objects, were not even slightly supported by the data from the accelerated light aging. The new lighting guideline we have at the National Museum looks much the same as the old, except that on the basis of microfading results, we've divided the red or sensitive range into three different parts, each with different exhibi exhibition recommendations. Okay, so here we have two years and ten, five years and ten, and up here we're around the blue wall two, blue wall one range, we make individual decisions. This is based on microfading. We consider for those uh, very rapidly fading materials what additional protection they might need, for example, in terms of proximity activated lights uh, and, and so on, uh, or whether we have replacements for them. If they're not so significant, in other words, if they're in only an intermittent demand for display rather than high demand, they're bumped down one category. Two years display becomes five years and so on. We've also liberalised light levels, abandoning strict 50 lux limits in most cases, except for fugitive colourants, which might be rapidly damaged. And we're allowing the light to be varied within a range of up to about 100 lux, according to what looks like good visibility to the lighting people. Because we have good specific fading rate information, and we have a common understanding through the uh, significance guidelines of the risks and how to talk about them, which is crucial, we are confident in being flexible. And this is a huge change to the atmosphere within exhibition meetings, if any of you have had to sit through those. So the impact on costs of microfading alone, forget about the significance assessment for the moment, of 200 objects shows that about half the objects that would have been limited to two years per decade have been extended out to five years or beyond based on their relative lack of light sensitivity. About 40% remained in the two year per decade category and for a very small but important group, the restrictions, as, as, as hard as they were, needed to be actually tightened up. The cost savings were estimated at about $400,000 just for these 200 objects over a 10 year exhibition, permanent exhibition cycle, and it cost about $40,000 to do the testing, which uh, in our case was very good value. I know it sounds too good to be true, but we are better protecting, I believe, the fast faders because we can identify them. It's very simple. And we have substantially improved access to a lot of objects and all at much lower cost than before. The impact of the significance assessment has not been calculated at this stage. And this part of the scheme has not been fully realised, partly because some conservators and curators are hesitant about it and partly because it's easier to outsource the decision to a scientist with a microfader. And I would urge institutions um, to take advantage of microfading, but not to outsource all of your decisions. To a, to a technical decision. However, it is making a difference and it looks like we're avoiding about 75% of our changeover costs by identifying and spending our money where it will make an important difference. And I'm told this is up to a million dollars a year, which um, that's a couple of conservative salaries there, right there. So what examples, what about those examples we looked at before with microfading now? So the, the black dress, like most modern dyed textiles is quite light fast and it now has no particular restrictions on its display and loan as a result of fading concerns. The characteristic orange dye in the basket is very fugitive. This here up above blue wall one. And this example being pristine would be carefully considered before being exhibited at all. We might choose one that's already been faded. And those yellow waterproof pants, well Restrictions based on fading over a 500 year period, which is what these lighting guidelines were based on, were always rather silly for a plasticised PVC item that might only last 100 years anyway in storage in the dark, if we're lucky, even if the exact colour were important, which I would argue it's not. And microfading tells us that it's fading is any, in any case down at the blue wall 4 range, at the bottom of that range of uh, fading rates that are of most concern to museums. So in summary, the National Museum of Australia was able to save money and better protect the most vulnerable objects from fading and allow more flexible lighting by directing its scarce resources to the most significant or important or valuable objects. 
those that are most exhibited and the most light sensitive objects for which colour loss would be a serious problem. So in summary, thank you for your attention and in particular I would really like to thank uh, Bertrand and his team, they um, have had trouble with me getting me out here. And uh, I'd like to thank my colleague Nikki Smith from the National Museum of Australia, my collaborator in, in much of this work. Thank you very much. Bruce for this very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, merci beaucoup. C'est une présentation très stimulante. Uh,